Now let's take a look at the notion of a logic family. So we have discussed how we have a set of basic gates. So we have an AND gate, you know, an OR gate, inverters, etc., etc. And we also then started talking about how we need to ensure that when one of these gates outputs a logic high, it is received as a logic high by the receiver. And similarly, when it outputs a logic low, it's received as a logic low. So we had this whole notion of the specifications that dictated things like the VOH min and max, the VOL min and max, and these were ranges of voltages that the output, uh, that the output would produce when producing a high and producing a low. And then as a designer, what we had to do was make sure that the receiver had a range of voltages, VIH and VIL, min and max on both, that could or that matched up with the output specifications such that when we output at a high it was guaranteed that the receiver would receive it as a high and when the output put out a low it was received as a low so there was a whole analysis involved in trying to figure out uh, if we could successfully transmit ones and zeros between the transmitter and the receiver so that analysis uh, we don't want to be able, we don't want to do that analysis each and every time we put down a logic circuit because we're going to be designing circuits that have hundreds of thousands if not millions of gates in them and so it becomes impractical to do that analysis so one of the ways to alleviate that is this concept of a logic family and a logic family is a set of gates that are designed to work with each other so it's a set of gates and it's more than just gates it's a set of gates or circuits uh, that all use the same technology such that they are designed to work with each other. So a logic family uh, might have all the basic gates, it might have some other some storage devices, it ha might have some more complicated uh, digital logic circuits, but in general within that logic family they're all going to use the same power supply, they're all going to use the same type of transistors to implement the gates, they're all going to use, you know, have the same sort of uh, maximum number of inputs, be able to drive the maximum number of outputs or maximum number of other gates. So a logic family is a nice way to kind of do the analysis of how we're going to transmit ones and zeros back and forth, but at the same time then get, you know, get moving ahead on the higher level design of the large logic system. So logic families have evolved over the past 50 years. So the first, you know, transistor was invented in the 40s, and the integrated circuit was invented in the in the 50s. And that's in, you know, digital integrated circuits really took off in the 60s and 70s. And as time went on, basically, you know, new transistors were invented, different different sizes of transistors were invented, different ways to process transistors were created. And so what we've seen is an evolution of logic families uh, that have continually evolved for the you know, 50 years. So there's been a lot of different logic families that have been created, and they will continue to be created as we find different ways to implement the, implement the technology within the actual device. So what we want to do is let's get started by looking at a, a general class of logic family, or it's basically like a technology, uh, and that is called CMOS. If you look at kind of just in general the most popular classes of logic families, you basically have two. So if you have logic families, we have one family which is called TTL and another, f not even a family, it's more of a class of families. Then we have another one called CMOS. So if you look at integrated circuits, in general, the way they're implemented is using either CMOS uh, technology or TTL technology. TTL stands for transistor to transistor logic. CMOS stands for complementary metal oxide semiconductor. And these, these are architectures of, how, of a type of transistor you use and the ways that you connect the transistors actually build these particular gates. Now, these within there, there are numerous logic families that are within CMOS and there are numerous logic families that are within TTL and this has to do with you know different sizes of transistors so you might have had a transistor that was 10 micrometers uh, uh, wide or in in length or something like that had a feature size of 10 mic 10 microns and then later you'd have one that was 1 micron and then later you'd have one that was 0 0.5 micron so these are all logic families within this class CMOS, and then same thing over here with TTL, you might have transistors that were, you know, 10 micron here, 1 micron here, so you have a bunch of different logic families that are within TTL, but the whole idea is that TTL represents an approach to make these basic gates using a certain type of transistor, 
and CMOS represents a different approach to making these basic gates with a type of transistor. So when we talk about CMOS, that's a general class, and then we always talk, we continue to dive down deeper by saying, okay, we have CMOS and it's a certain type of transistor. Now, these logic families, these are going to have things like same power supply, same type of, you know, size transistor and have design constraints, which kind of dictate uh, dictate the speed and the performance that you're actually going to get and the power consumption that you're going to get. So in the beginning, TTL was the first uh, was the first way that logic was implemented. And one of the problems with TTL is it was it was good. It was it got everything started, but it consumed a lot of power when it was not switching. So it tended to not scale very well. So what happened is that as digital circuits got bigger and bigger. Uh, CMOS was adopted as a way to reduce the amount of power when nothing was switching. And what I mean is, you know, you're going to have these digital signals and when you're switching, when you're switching, there's power consumed. And er yeah, yeah, everybody has to accept that. It's like it takes power to do work. So it takes, it takes, you know, watts to make that transition. But the key was what happens with power consumption when you're sitting at a high or a low? Well, it turned out that in TTL, there was power being consumed just to hold the high and hold the low. Well, that, that was not a good thing. Even if it was a small amount of power, once you start having you know, hundreds of thousands of transistors or millions of transistors, that power became very excessive. So CMOS was, a, was an approach that allowed you to mitigate or significantly shrink the amount of power that was consumed during these steady states. So today what you see is all of the integrated circuits, all of the large digital integrated circuits are implemented with CMOS. So your smartphones, your computers, your you know, microprocessors today uh, are all using CMOS and that has to do with the ability to have low power during this uh, steady state. And then also what has happened is that CMOS has allowed transistors, just the way that you implement a CMOS transistor, has allowed it to scale in terms of the feature sizes. So you're able to shrink a CMOS transistor significantly. And so all the effort has been going into trying to make sure that a CMOS transistor can get smaller and smaller so that you can pack more and more transistors on a chip. So the first ones were, you know, 10 micron, uh, then they went down to, you know, 5 micron, 1 micron, and then they went down to 0.5 and et cetera, et cetera. And so if you look at where we're at in, let's say, 2015, I mean, we're down to 22 nanometer feature sizes, 18 nanometer feature sizes, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's significantly, uh, it's a very small. And this is how you're able to get millions, if not billions, of transistors on a single integrated circuit. So what we want to start doing is let's take a, we want to look at the details of CMOS, but before we do that, let's talk about some general specifications for a logic family. Uh, one of the, one of the, there's two just general specifications that we always talk about, and one of them is called fan-in. And fan-in is going to be associated with a particular logic family, and fan-in is the number of inputs on a gate. And it's actually not just the number, it's the max number of inputs on a gate. And what that means is that if I had an AND gate, so we talked about a, a two input AND gate. Well, it's like, okay, that's, that's my gate. Well, we might also have a three input AND gate in that same logic family. So we have a two input and a three input AND gate. Then you say, well, I need a four input AND gate. And then you say, okay, well, that's great. So how many inputs can you have? So if the inputs if the maximum or the number is four here, the question becomes, how many can you actually have? Well, it turns out you can't have an in infinite number of inputs just due to the way that the transistors are configured. You can only have a certain amount of them before the device stops operating properly. So the fan in represents the maximum number of inputs on a gate or, yeah, within a particular logic family. So if I came in and I said, I've got a fan in of six, what does that mean? That means that the largest number of inputs on any gate would be six. So I could have a six input AND gate. I could also have a six input OR gate, okay? So that's what that number means. So it doesn't mean that you can't have a two input and a four input, it just means that the maximum number is six. And th these are associated with a particular logic family. So one of the things that you might do is say, okay, I wanna, I've decided that to meet my design objectives, I need to use the CMOS approach to implementing logic. I need to use a, uh, let's say, a 
0 0.8 micron process and what and then I first thing I do is I look at that and I say well, what's what is the fan in specification of this logic family and they say well it's it's six and it's like okay so I know now that I have uh, gates with a maximum number of of inputs of six and that becomes important as you get larger and larger digital systems together because what you're going to see is that as the circuits get larger you might require something that has a seven input and operation so if your fan in is only six that means you're going to have to do some logic manipulation to break up that uh, break up that seven input and operation to use technology that is available Another specification for a particular logic family that's of interest is what we call fan out. And fan out is the maximum number of gates from within the same logic family that can be driven. And they can, that can be driven by a single output. And what does that mean? So what that means is that if you think about, let's just take a, an inverter for example. You have an inverter and you're going to drive another inverter. Well, could you conceivably drive two inverters? Well, the answer is yes. Okay? And that, the reason is, is that we've kind of discussed this. We'll look at it a little bit more detail. But the input current for these gates, especially in CMOS, is negligible. I mean, it's very, very small and the amount of output that can be provided is much larger than the inputs that's taken. So I.O., the maximum I.O. spec, is much larger than the, ma the maximum I.I. spec. And that's because when you're driving on the output, you, you're going to drive other gates from within the same logic family, but you might also drive things like LEDs and resistors and stuff like that. So when you're driving other gates, it's very easy to drive multiple other gates. So we won't violate any input specification or any output current specifications if we drive multiple gates. The problem becomes when you start adding more and more gates on here. So if I said I'm going to drive three inverters. So, okay, well that's fine too. I certainly am not going to violate any, any maximum current output specification. But how many can I add? So can I continue, can I add a million? Can I add a hundred million? It turns out that you can't do that. And the reason you can't continue to add just an infinite number of loads from the same family is it has to do with the switching characteristics. So each of these is going to put a AC load on it, or said another way, it's a capacitive load on the output. And what it does is it has the impact of if this was the original output with no load, as you add more and more gates to it, it starts rolling off the square wave nature the, or the, the transition time. And as we've talked about, we don't want a slow rise time because we have a transition region or an uncertainty region which we want to blast through. We want to get through this transition region as quickly as possible. So if you slow down your output rise time or output fall time, you're going to sit within this uncertainty region for a longer than expected time. So what, what the designers of a logic family do is they say, okay, how many loads can I put on a single output without slowing down the rise time so much that I hang out in this uncertainty region for, uh, for too long? So they, they limit how many loads you can put on there to guarantee that you're never actually hanging out in that region for too long. So that's going to be the fan out spec. So a fan out, if somebody came along and said, all right, so I have a fan out of for this logic family, my fan out was 10. That means I can drive any single output pin can drive 10 other inputs. So if I had, let's just say I had an AND gate and it was going to drive a bunch of inverters, I could use that to drive one, I could drive two, I could drive a whole bunch till I got down to 10. So I could have actually 10 inverters that I'm driving. So those are kind of the two general, the general specifications that are linked to a particular logic family. And so the next step we want to do is, is to try to just get an overview of what's going on within the, the CMOS logic category and also with the TTL logic category to give us some perspective in terms of how these actual gates are built.